So welcome everyone. Thank you for showing up today to the colloquium talk. It's my pleasure to introduce Tan Tzu Dillon. He's a candidate for Astro Materials and Solar System Formation uh, tenure track position. Uh, Tan Tzu graduated with his bachelor's degree in 2013 as a double major in physics and electrical and electronics engineering from the Middle Eastern Technical University. In 2015, he got his master's in physics from Harvard University, and then quickly after in 2018, uh, got his PhD also at Harvard in physics. Uh, his thesis was a trans-dimensional perspective on dark matter. Um, and today he'll be talking about um, exoplanets uh, as part of the position. Um, he has been a postdoc from 2018 to 2021 uh, as a postdoc of a Keeley Fellow at MIT, and then has since uh, 2021 has been a visiting postdoctoral associate at Princeton University. So he's joining us from Princeton today. And he's also been the test or the transit exoplanet survey satellite um, postdoctoral associate uh, part of MIT. Um, He's been selected to be part of the New Frontier Development Lab research team, which is an artificial intelligence research accelerator established by NASA, as well as SETI uh, Institute to apply AI technologies to challenges in space exploration for the benefit of humankind. Uh, Tansu has made significant contributions and has numerous research publications in multiple research fields, including uh, cosmology, astroparticle physics, astrostatistics, um, and exoplanets. Um, he works on the discovery and characterization of exoplanets and as well the detection of dark matter. He's part of the test team to help vet the uh, data for NASA as well as he works on uh, analyzing the data. So today his colloquium talk will be shining light on planet formation via structural, orbital, and atmospheric characterization of exoplanets. Take it away, Tansu. Thank you, Jeffrey. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be giving this colloquium today. So um, as noted, I will be talking about planetary formation and what exoplanets can teach us about planetary uh, formation. Uh, and with that, let me actually start with a nice uh, photograph of the sky from the Transiting Exoplanet Survey satellite mission, where you're seeing one fraction of a CCD. This is where I've been doing my postdoc. Um, and currently I'm a, a postdoc at Princeton, a visiting appointment at Princeton, still affiliated with MIT. Okay, I will start with a quick reminder that uh, our wonders of the celestial sphere have originated from our solar system. In fact, solar system is really the very first, um, offered the very first objects that attracted our attention, like the moon, sun, and the various other planets that uh, zipped across the sky at ancient times. You're looking at Harmonia Macrocosmica, uh, one of the very first heliocentric uh, models uh, where one of the publications where this model was depicted. And on the right, you're actually looking at a carpet on the, on the floor of Princeton's astrophysics department, where I really like this carpet. I mean, every time I walk on it, you actually see um, the whole universe on a log stretch. And um, I, I only photographed in this part, the solar system. You can see it basically starts from the earth and goes up. You can actually see Oort cloud over there at the top. It does go beyond that, but I, I, that didn't fit in the, um, in the image. But basically the point is, uh, thinking about this, actually the, the half of the observable universe, if you put it on a log stretch, is actually the solar system or is within the solar system, especially if you start from meter size objects, the observable universe is like what, 10 to 27 meters or so, and solar system goes down uh, up to about 10 to 13 meters. So it's roughly um, starting from a meter scale, um, it's really half of the observable universe. There's a lot of richness in the solar system, a lot of processes that require exploration and explanation, and exoplanets are very useful as I will be soon arguing. 
Um, so how did the solar system form? Well, the quick answer is we don't know, but when once we start digging into details, there are two generic ideas that are applicable. First is gravitational instability. So you basically have a protostar and a disk forms around it due to conservation of angular momentum. As the system collapses, it has to conserve angular momentum. It does so by having a disk. Um, uh, and basically, once you have a disk, there are two ways to form planets out of the disk. You can either use gravitational instability, where it's basically a bottom-to-top approach. Uh, clouds co collapse onto themselves after some fragmentation and form giant planets. Or you can first form a core, which then accretes objects, uh, sorry, uh, gas around it to, to make objects like we, what we call planets. Um, gravitational instability is already invoked when we explain stellar formation. When stars form, we invoked gravitational instability and fragmentation. But planets, we think, uh, uh, are uh, they, they mostly form through what we call core accretion. Um, there is good evidence supporting core accretion versus gravitational instability, and I will uh, talk about that partly in the remainder of this talk. So, um, and the set of ideas regarding the formation of the uh, solar system can also uh, essentially be broken down into two different classes when it comes to how matter moves on the disk. There is the oligarchic um, model where you have this roughly equally sized planetary embryos that interact with each other, obviously collide, and eventually produce the planets we see. And there's pebble accretion, where you basically, uh, in, in both scenarios, there's a big planet, our Jupiter, forming first, and then it does some grand tax, which I will not go into detail very much. But basically, beyond Jupiter, beyond the frost line, you got these chondrites, and eventually they mix in with the inner solar system. And how they do so, whether it's through pebble, pebble accretion or not, is an unsolved question in um, planet formation. And it's not obvious how to connect this to our solar system and the generic models. And um, basically, there's one ingredient in this problem, which I want to draw your attention to, which is uh, planets beyond our solar system. Here, you're seeing my daughter basically holding a copy of a very important book. Every physicist, I hope, will recognize this. It's the Philosophiae Naturalis Principia Mathematica from Isaac Newton. And at the end of this book, if you actually look at it, there's a general scholium, essentially a discussion section. And in this uh, discussion section, Newton does something very interesting. He actually says, um, just quoting, and if the fixed stars are the centers of other like systems, these being formed by the likewise council must be all subject to the dominion of one. He, what he basically means is that if the physics around other fixed stars are the same, they should have roughly the same architecture and same physical processes. So he's basically sending a pointer to exoplanets some many centuries ago. And um, he doesn't necessarily use the word exoplanet, but he actually means it. And um, when we think about exoplanets, that is planets beyond our solar system, um, the very first thing you can uh, probably uh, think about in this context is protoplanetary disks beyond our solar system. And certainly that's, that's an excitement. And very recently we had very uh, interesting progress in this, uh, in this uh, direction. First, there was D-sharp uh, through ALMA that, that you may have heard about about five years ago or so. Um, we, we received the very first high resolution images of these protoplanetary disks in submillimeter astronomy. And we also are receiving similar um, pictures, very cool pictures of these objects in infrared as well. One thing you'll see is that uh, there are certainly um, asymmetries and warps and gaps in these um, in these protoplanetary disks, which we think are carved out by planets that are just forming. So once you have a Jupiter, it basically undergoes runaway gas accretion and it sweeps all the gas there is around at least around its orbit and you suddenly you have um, some gaps. These gaps could potentially be also produced by uh, instabilities and uh, magnetohydrodynamics, etc. So we haven't really seen 
and evidence that uh, there's an exoplanet within these gaps, but we hope to do so very soon. And I think this is going to be very exciting news for everyone involved. Now, when it comes to exoplanets, that is just, I'm not now talking about protoplanetary disks, but actually exoplanets that have formed, what can these then further tell us about the solar system? Well, first of all, let me just uh, highlight that um, exoplanets, the, the very first thing we learn from exoplanets is demographics. It is uh, formation of any uh, planetary system is a highly st stochastic process. Uh, that is, if even if you start with roughly the same initial conditions, due to the stochasticity of the underlying physical processes, you will end up with a distribution of outputs. And exoplanets then allow us to really probe the, all the outcomes of this very stochastic process. There are many things you could be wondering about exoplanets. There is structure, so just radius mass, their equation of state, and the resulting density, and how that density uh, can point to various compositions. There is atmospheres, again composition-wise, but you could also start wondering about the heat recirculation, the climate, and the, also due to existence of potential clouds and reflectivity as well. There is space weather, essentially how planets interact with their stars, how they're so-called irradiated, and how this affects their potential habitability, even though this is not really related to planet formation. That is certainly one of the excitements we have about exoplanets. And then there is orbital architecture. There's migration. Um, planets do migrate. There are very good reasons for why we should think that planets migrate. I will come to that very soon. There are dynamical resonances, basically, once uh, orbits are multiple uh, multiples of each other in units of frequency, we get resonances. And finally, if you think about all of these, you can study them as a function of time. So if you look at young systems or systems at particular ages, which you can measure, then you can probe, start probing evolutionary processes, how, say, structure changes as a function of time, how atmospheres react to any radiation, etc., as a function of time. You can start answering such questions. One of the highlight missions uh, in this uh, exoplanet field has been, as I'm sure you may have heard about it, um, transit is exoplanet transiting exoplanet survey satellite, uh, short for TESS. So TESS is an optical uh, telescope. It's an optical survey. It uh, basically uh, surveys roughly the full sky, not exactly the full sky, but roughly the full sky. So far, we have uh, observed about 90% of it. Um, and it searches for transiting small exoplanets. Small is the keyword here, because if you're in space, the best thing uh, you can do is look for small exoplanets as opposed to larger ones, which you can also do from ground. So small means you need your um, photometric precision has to scale well. It has to be good enough, uh, and space-based photometry actually allows it. It has four uh, large field of view cameras, 24 by 24 degrees each. So it gives you basically a 24 by 96 degrees uh, field of view at one go. And using these large exposures, we actually cover roughly the full sky in uh, chunks of two-year missions. We already had the primary mission done by 2020. Now we're in the first extended mission, and we will soon be starting a second extended mission. Uh, it is funded by NASA with uh, some great, uh, seed funding from Google. So um, it uses, probably the audience will know about this, but I just wanted to make this more pedagogical. Uh, it uses the transit method. So basically you've got some background light source and you're watching for the total brightness of the object. And as if, if you do this with high enough cadence, eventually you will start seeing so-called transits. That is the total amount of light that you get from the background light source will drop by some, by some amount, which we call the depth. And uh, also for a certain uh, time, which we call the duration. And the depth and duration of a transit are two principal components which you can measure. But there are many other things you can measure given a transit, um, such as its shape and also color. 
And those things will allow us basically to fully characterize uh, the occulting object. But as I said, the principal components are really the depth from which we can deduce the, tra the transiting objects uh, radius, or at least the radius ratio with the background object. So if, for example, using the Gaia telescope, somehow you, you make sure that you can measure the radius of the background star, then you know, proportionally speaking, the radius of the occulting object as well. Um, and then how, what, what science can we do this with, with this data? Well, we first take, um, um, take the full frame images, then look at the light curves. So extract light curves of certain sources, and then analyze these light curves using the box least squares method. I won't really go into this, but basically the idea is we look for periodic transits. And once we find these, then we feed them into neural nets in order to first do a coarse triage. We have to do triaging because there are too many things to, for humans to look at or even um, algorithmically to look at. Uh, and then once we uh, pass through um, the triaging uh, part, we can actually start analyzing the data. Um, first, using feature detections, feature engineering, we just look for certain features and then humans actually vet these uh, data to eventually come up with the so-called test object of interest catalog. So far, we have over 5,000 planet candidates in this catalog from TESS, and some good fraction of it, something like 30% of those, all of those, come from a single paper that I co-led with Michel um, uh, earlier this year, um, basically, which is um, a so-called faint star search, where we are doing or rather redoing the full test analysis pipeline um, uh, by looking at the full frame images, not just pixel target, target pixel data. This may sound like jargon if you're not very used to tests, but basically what I'm saying is we, we look at the full sky or whatever sky is available to us. We extract the light curves, we then you know, pass through the usual algorithms, and then finally we alert these uh, once we find uh, certain signals uh, that are consistent with periodic transiting events. And as you can see here, um, the other PM means basically um, other primary mission. Uh, what we are finding is systematically fainter um, and systematically larger than the previous TOIs. This is expected. And basically this gives us uh, the ability to really probe hot Jupiters and also their occurrence rate very soon. Um, this is an ongoing work and we have another work in prep right now uh, that is now targeting the first extended mission. Here you can see that using uh, with the orange color, uh, it's called extended mission one in this context as opposed to the primary mission. And um, using these um, extended mission sources, we will be drilling further into M dwarf population, which requires um, higher cadence, which we just obtained in the extended mission. For those of you who may not be thinking about this every day, TESS in the extended mission increased its cadence to 10 minutes uh, from 30 minutes, basically increasing here in the sense of having a higher frequency of observation. So we are using these 10 minute cadence data, we are now able to find more planets around low mass stars uh, for which transit duration is just shorter. Um, and what we then do with these planet candidates is we try to forward model their light curves. In addition, also we use auxiliary data like radial velocity from ground-based observatories. And eventually uh, we use LS Fitter. LS Fitter is a code I de co-developed with Max. And um, uh, basically our purpose was to find, is to, what, what was to write a software which is um, readily usable by undergraduates and sometimes even high school students. There, um, we don't um, put a lot of emphasis on the graphical user in the interface, although there is actually a graphical user interface as well. But the idea is that uh, it's a low uh, barrier entry into exoplanet research to interface data from TESS, Kepler, and similar surveys to do cutting edge exoplanet science. So now let's um, step into the world of 
uh, exoplanet demographics. So I want to just highlight a couple of interesting demographic uh, properties of exoplanets. And also I will talk about some more recent results later on. So um, these plots are just from NASA exoplanet archive, the ones that I will, I'm showing right now in the next uh, two slides. Um, so here uh, on the left, you're looking at the mass uh, period distribution. You see, for example, the hot Jupiter distribution around here, and there are uh, colder Jupiters and lower mass stars. Um, on the right, this is very much related. Now you're looking the, at the radius period distribution. This small chunk here, the below four Earth radii, these are known as sub-Neptunes and super-Earths mostly, whereas here we have the hot Jupiters. A um, couple of numbers that probably will be very useful for the remainder of the talk. Um, Jupiter's radius is about 10 Earth radii, something that you may want to keep in mind for the rest of the talk. And Neptune is four Earth radii. So Jupiter is around here. So whenever I say super Jupiter at me, I'm referring to this population. And you may see that there's a huge tail towards large radii. These are highly irradiated. Otherwise, we wouldn't really expect um, a steady state exoplanet, a cold exoplanet to have such large radii. Uh, these are more consistent with brown dwarfs and low mass stars, but they are actually highly irradiated. And not obvious in this projection is that there's actually a lot of inner structure to the small planets, which I will soon cover. Um, and here you're looking at the density versus mass distribution. So you can see that low mass uh, exoplanets around here, these are the small exoplanets, uh, they have a uh, decreasing density as a function of mass. That just means that their metallicity is actually dropping. Um, which uh, we kind of expect. And then um, their densities kind of scale up again because of the fact that they're becoming more and more like stars and their surface gravity is increasing. On the right, this is the inverted pro, uh, plot where on the x-axis you now have radius. So even though the plot on the left is actually one-to-one -one function, it decreases and then it increases, the one on the right, unfortunately, is not that easy. So it decreases and then suddenly there's a chaos at very large radii. And this is unfortunate for us when we do test science because with tests, the only thing we first measure about a, a planet candidate is its uh, radius. So for example, if you were to measure the radius of a transiting object to be something like what, uh, 15, then you have really no idea what density it has. So basically it has to then remain as, um, as a planet candidate for a long time until we can actually confirm it to be a planetary substellar object. So the planet hunting is an ongoing process. Um, we have so far about 5,000 uh, candidates, uh, sorry, uh, confirmed planets on the NASA Exoplanet Archive. Here you're seeing the, the number of discoveries, differential number of discoveries uh, for every year. Uh, there are two spikes that come from the two giant Kepler papers. And then very lately, uh, with respect to, uh, thanks to tests and various other surveys, we do have an increasing number again. With TESS, we are not expecting huge spikes like these, but TESS is indeed in, um, adding a lot of uh, planet uh, detections into this plot, especially in the last two years or so, 2020 and 2021. Um, now, a couple of interesting trends that may um, attract your attention about exoplanets. Some of these are pretty old stuff, actually. So one of the very first demographic uh, results from exoplanet field was that um, the occurrence rate of exoplanets um, is actually um, increasing with, um, with the uh, metallicity. And uh, this is a 2004 results and is still something that and that, that's, that's very exciting and appealing to the current research as well. Um, and this is kind of expected because um, if you have more metals around, then uh, it should be um, easier to form planets, basically, um, because we think that the planetary cores are made of high metallicity matter, unlike hydrogen and helium. And um, another uh, trend that you will already be very familiar with from the solar system is that uh, masses of planets actually anti-correlate with their metallicity. This is something we know from the solar system, especially if you look at our four giants. Uh, and this is 
uh, indeed highlighted here with the orange colors, the Uranus, Neptune, Saturn here, and Jupiter. Um, as the mass of the giant planets increase, their metallicity drops. So Jupiter basically is made up of mostly hydrogen and helium, and the hydrogen and helium content of the giant planets decrease with increasing, uh, um, sorry, increase with decreasing mass. Now, um, this roughly is also the case for exoplanets, planets beyond our solar system, although there is considerable spread in this, um, in this, uh, in this relation. And the spread is certainly due to the quantities we just can't control for. Um, around other stars, we have other um, uh, irradiation histories, we have uh, other initial metallicities, and every star evolves in a slightly unique way. So because of that, um, and there are stochastic, completely random processes as well, because of all that, there's, there's a huge spread. And trying to really account for the variance in this histogram or whatever, the scatter plot, I think is one of the most curious exercises of exoplanet research. Now, another feature that you, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with is the so-called um, radius valley. Um, this is what some five-year-old results um, that was enabled by the so-called California Kepler survey, which um, allowed um, the radii estimates of uh, Kepler detected, the subset of Kepler detections to be reduced. And as a result, we suddenly started to see that there's a bifurcation of small planets in terms of their radius. That is, there's a small radius clump um, around, you know, smaller than about 1.6 Earth radii or so, and there's a larger crumb, uh, which we call sub-Neptunes. The, the former is called super-Earths. Um, the, the second bump starts at around 1.8 uh, Earth radius or so, and goes to up to about 3.5 Earth radius. And uh, this is not the original CKS paper, by the way. This is uh, one of the later ones by uh, Ben, BJ, and uh, Eric. Um, and um, this, this is actually um, post Gaia DR2. So Gaia, for those of you who don't think about this, Gaia is, is a European Space Agency telescope that's uh, doing astrometry, so measuring, uh, very precisely measuring the positions of the stars on the sky. Using this information, we can actually deduce the radii of the stars through Stefan Boltzmann equation. And then using the radii, uh, we can start shrinking the uncertainties of planetary radius. One thing you should always keep in mind with indirect detection of exoplanets is that uh, we have to know our stars to the precision we expect from our exoplanets. That is, we almost always characterize exoplanets um, based on whatever precision and accuracy is available to the characterization of the star it's, uh, itself. Because if you're using transit method, then the transit depth essentially is consistent or it gives you the star, uh, sorry, planet to star ratio in terms of radius. So if you only know the stellar radius to what 20%, um, even the best photometric precision won't really get you anywhere um, uh, in terms of your time domain survey. So this is really work in collaboration with Gaia. And on the right, you're looking pretty much at the same thing, but now you also have stellar intensity uh, or essentially irradiation on the other axis. So you can, you can see that there's basically a bifurcation of small planets into two um, regimes. This is roughly the same thing, but now you have a radius versus mass. And um, we, we have a lot of things to learn from small exoplanets because uh, their density uh, is very complicated. Um, uh, they might be completely made of iron. Uh, they might have a smaller iron fraction and more water or silicate, and they might also have gaseous envelopes around them. So there's a lot of equation of state you can pass through this plane. And we have, until very recently, we had very few data points, reliable data points on this plane. With TESS, this is now changing, and with uh, the primary objective of TESS has been to find exoplanets amenable to uh, detailed characterization, and most of this detail is in mass. So um, we now, using bright stars and planets detected around bright stars, we are now able to 
uh, conduct accurate mass measurements of these exoplanets. And this will then allow us to um, determine the structural po population model of exoplanets very soon, or at least improve our models. Now, um, you may also wonder how does this uh, whole uh, you know, bifurcation thing uh, work with young planets? Unfortunately, if you were to make the previous plot I showed you with the bifurcation, for only young planets, we wouldn't have that many to actually populate the plot. Um, we only know exoplanets around young stars uh, with limited st uh, statistics, and this is because young stars are rare. Uh, you have to do a full sky mission just like TESS. So TESS has been spearheading, in fact, the science in finding uh, exoplanets around young stars. It was indeed started with K2, but um, just as a reminder, K2 wasn't a primary design uh, of the mission. It was Kepler, and it then turned into K2, kind of because that was the only thing we could do. And it was definitely a great thing that eventually we had K2, because K2 started um, looking at various other uh, fields along the ecliptic, and it did start indeed finding young planets. But with TESS, now the number is really very much increasing. And in this plot, you're looking at um, those young exoplanets that have been detected in the last few years. And um, this is actually a plot from a work in progress, HIP 94235B. Um, and uh, you can see that basically um, we are now populating this this region around, you know, uh, uh, around the middle of this uh, plot, where the radius is around just super Neptune or so five Earth radius, we believe that there is a, a paucity, there's there's a rareness of exoplanets around here, and uh, we think that that's because exoplanets they may be born here, but they move away from this region very quickly. Um, they likely lose their atmosphere, so they shrink, and they move to the right and uh, down and right on this uh, plot um, to eventually populate this, this region uh, in a few hundred millions of years. Now, I talked about young stars. Uh, there's another special uh, type of planetary system that I personally think uh, are, is very interesting. And I think there's a community uh, consensus that they are so as well. And that's multi-planetary systems. Multi-planetary systems are great because they allow us to do comparative characterization. Um, one thing that I kind of swept under the rug so far during my talk is the fact that you know, we have these very nice exoplanets, but they all live next to a different star. That's, I mean, these are drawn from a different population, uh, so they have unique quantities. So whenever you have detections around different stars, it's really hard to compare them put them on the same uh, plot, for example. But you can actually do this when there is a single star and multiple planets around it, because now you have a controlled experiment. So all the planets around the same star have received roughly the same insulation history, obviously at different levels, but the history has been roughly the same. The time history has been roughly the same. And they are also born out of the same um, proto star. And Obviously, they're born at different locations on the protoplanetary disk, and that's what makes it very exciting that they actually sample different chunks of the protoplanetary disk, and it does indeed allow us to start at least asking how we can, um, how we can test models of planetary formation using such systems. Here, I'm just showing um, one example from such, uh, from such exercise, TOI-1233. It's got an HD number. It makes you probably remember that this is a very bright star, 108-236. I also have a pointer to TOI-1339, which I did not lead, but I, I was the co-lead uh, to uh, mentor a PhD student on, on its discovery. So these systems essentially allow us to uh, really um, put out systems which uh, in the era of JWST and uh, further study with HSD are really going to be cosmic laboratories for doing comparative atmospheric characterization. Um, and just contextualizing TY1233 on the radius uh, valley histogram I was talking about here, you have four planets. In fact, Cheops uh, followed up this system and actually discovered a fifth 
planet in the same system. So I, I don't have it because this is uh, directly taken from the paper, but we do, we do have a fifth planet around here, actually, around two Earth radius in the same system now. So, um, but you can see that the innermost planet is well within the radius valley, which is uh, exciting on its own. By the way, I do want to emphasize this is a valley, not a gap. Sometimes it's called a gap, but we do indeed see a lot of uh, exoplanets, although rarely, within the gap. For some time, people have wondered, including myself, whether these actually were um, so basically our radius resolution in this plane was such under result such that um, th maybe we, we were just closing the uh, an otherwise gap um, but it turns out that with increasing radius resolution despite increasing res radius resolution with Gaia DR2 the gap is not closing which means that the gap is just a region of uh, transitionary region essentially that there are planets in the gap or whatever in the in the valley but um, they're just more rare. Um, one quick note about TOI 533, it's the brightest sun-like star on the night sky to be transited by at least four uh, planets. And uh, this already gives it a very important record in being one of the most important targets uh, as, as a test bed for, uh, for comparative atmospheric characterization, because we really like bright stars. Uh, but we also want there to be multiple uh, planets transiting that bright star, and TOI 1233 is one of the uh, primary examples of, of such a cosmic laboratory. Uh, the uh, follow-up and further characterization of this system is ongoing. Here you can see the four planets, how they are distributed in terms of their radius and expected mass, and I have been leading the uh, the precision radial velocity follow-up of this system. And I've already talked about this, so I won't spend too much time, but TY 1233 uh, will definitely be um, an interesting target with uh, follow-up studies with JWST, where the idea is we point um, a space-based uh, uh, telescope like JWST at the target during the transit so that we actually uh, look for spectroscopic changes during transit, um, which then tells us uh, what kind of molecules, absorbers, emitters there are in the atmosphere, such as water, methane, carbon monoxide, and carbon dioxide. Especially when it comes to JWST, exciting part is really carbon dioxide and methane. Water has been uh, very much explored thanks to HST, but JWST will be unique in its coverage of uh, carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide and methane. All right, so I talked enough, I believe, about atmospheres. Now, I just want to switch gears, talk about dynamics a little. Um, so here I'm talking about a, an, interest, an interesting problem, uh, which is that um, uh, we know that an object called hot Jupiter exists. Let me just take a step back. Uh, the very first exoplanet that was discovered was not a hot Jupiter. It was around a dead star in 1992, a pulsar. But soon after that, the very, uh, maybe one of the very first detections was around a sun-like star. Uh, and that was essentially a hot Jupiter in 1995, uh, Nature paper. And um, that was certainly an interesting uh, discovery because initially people thought that um, hot Jupiters wouldn't exist for good reasons, because we just took our solar system and put, put it around other stars. And then doing that exercise, it's really hard to think that there could be something like a hot Jupiter so close to its star because none such, none such object exists in our solar system. So it was a big surprise to the astronomers of mid-1990s to actually find out that there's a substellar object with very small mass that's so close to uh, its, um, its star and have such, uh, has such a large uh, large mass still. I mean, it's substellar, but still Jupiter-like mass. That was certainly not expected. So then the next step was to try to explain how hot Jupiters could even exist. There are two ideas. Um, first, it's, uh, it's thought that it just can't be produced in situ. That is, there's, there's no planetary formation mechanism that actually predicts that 
a hot Jupiter can form so close to its star. So there are two remaining hypotheses. There's either di disk migration, that is the Jupiter basically exchanges angular momentum with the disk early on. And as the disk gets um, thrown out of the system, uh, Jupiter basically loses angular momentum and uh, comes very close to the star. That's one hypothesis. The other hypothesis is called high eccentricity migration. And high eccentricity migration essentially predicts that Jupiter's exchange again angular momentum, but with other planets, other intact planets in catastrophic scattering events. And then they're thrown out onto very eccentric ob uh, orbits, which then dissipate eventually and circularize uh, efficiently. Um, and at the end, you basically uh, are left with a, um, with, with a hot Jupiter. So uh, how do we dis distinguish those two um, explanations? Well, it turns out that we can do so using the eccentricity and semi-major axis distribution of exoplanets. And high eccentricity migration essentially predicts that we will have many exoplanets in the form of very high eccentricity and uh, small periods. So the, there should be basically almost like a power law distribution here. Um, so these would be transitionary uh, uh, planets that are in the process of circularizing. Uh, whereas uh, disk migration pretty much uh, expects uh, Jupiters to move in without gaining a lot of eccentricity. Um, certainly at this point, we are not in a position to actually rule out one over the other because there's also some support for disk migration because we tend to find Jupiters with close companions, which is otherwise impossible or very unlikely uh, in the case of planet-planet scattering. So there are, I think, uh, there's supporting evidence for both schools of thought and you just need more data. Here, I'm just showing a plot where we basically um, uh, announced the discovery of TOI 677b, which was basically uh, a, an addition into, in, into this uh, plot at a, at a region of the phase space where we really need data. So that was an exciting addition. Now, I talked about uh, space weather a bit. I just, I won't spend too much time here, but I just want to highlight the fact that the, um, the radius valley I talked about um, has to do with the fact that um, stars interact very aggressively with their exoplanets very early on when this, uh, when this system is very young. So uh, uh, studying uh, stellar flares is a very important exercise. Uh, quantifying their occurrence rate as a function of stellar type essentially will give us the ability to, to really predict uh, around which stars and around what ages uh, stars are able to erode the atmospheres uh, of their exoplanets and cause atmospheric escape. I already talked about how Jupiter's uh, kind of out of sequence, but here is a nice at least animation. Uh, this is an animation of WASP-121b. I did talk about how unexpected they were. And one thing just for may maybe for me to add is that they're very observationally accessible because they're large and they're so close to their stars. And that pretty much explains why they were the very first discovery um, uh, or close to being the very first discovery. Um, and here you're looking at WASP-121b again. Uh, this is one of my uh, previous papers where we looked at the phase uh, phase curve of uh, test phase curve of WASP-121b and modeled it such that we were able to get the day side emission. Uh, the day side emission tells us a lot about the kinematics. It constrains the albedo and the heat recirculation efficiency. Uh, and it also allows us to um, uh, constrain the, the pressure versus temperature of the atmosphere, as well as the chemical composition of the atmosphere. These are obviously models that we pass through the data that I just showed. So the data itself is just these black data points. As a function of phase, you just measure the brightness of the system and it gives you the day site um, emission of the planet. But then you go ahead and model it using some uh, radiative transfer code. And then you basically get these lines where you, you kind of argue that there's some ionization on the day side and there are titanium oxide and vanadium oxide, which we think is the 
cause of the temperature pressure inversion that you are seeing here. By the way, temperature pressure inversion is something that we are all used to. Our Earth has one as well, but for different reasons. It's it's the ozone which is making that, but in around hot Jupiters, that's not the case. Now, very recently, a few weeks ago, we published another paper on the same uh, on the same system, but this time we actually used HSD to do a global of all viewing angle spectroscopy of, of the system, including the night side. And night side spectroscopy, in fact, is the very first uh, time which uh, when this was done. So this is definitely pioneering work. Um, and we showed that on the day side, we already knew this, but on the day side, we have an emission feature from water, whereas on the night side, it actually goes away, becomes an absorption. So that means um, on the night side, you actually have hydrogen and uh, oxygen come together, uh, re recombine and absorb uh, emission, whereas on the day side, it mostly dissociates. And using all these hot Jupiters and their test light curves, pre previously we also took a look at um, what their population models essentially start emerging to look like. So here you have a, a plot of their reflectivity and equilibrium temperature. And it basically shows that there's a tentative correlation between the equilibrium temperature and uh, reflectivity. We think that this could be essentially due to uh, clouds uh, refractory clouds that are uh, also reflecting. Uh, refractory in the sense that they can actually um, withstand day-side temperatures of order past 2000 Kelvin or so, uh, and they can also reflect light. So that's an exciting outcome of, um, of uh, phase curve exploration of exoplanets using tests. Now, again, switching gears a bit, um, there's another highlight from the test mission, which is the uh, uh, planet transiting white dwarf, the very first intact planet transiting a white dwarf, WD 1856. Um, this was basically a work that was extending over multiple years where we first got the detection from tests and did some follow-up. Here on the left, you're seeing the GTC light curve from Canary Islands and then some uh, Spitzer follow-up light curve just before it actually was decommissioned. You're seeing that the depths, uh, the depths are consistent. As a reminder, on the left, you've got a 0.5 micron measurement, whereas on the right-hand side, it's Spitzer, a uh, long band, so it's 4.5 micron. So the fact that those two are consistent essentially means that we're looking at a stellar object that is not too massive, so it's not emitting itself. Now, before um, I close, I just want to talk about uh, an application, uh, a, a potential um, um, a potential, a potential synergy between solar system science um, and exoplanet research uh, in the coming years, which is in situ exploration of exoplanetary material. Now, one thing that I haven't mentioned is that even though we are able to break uh, the degeneracies to some extent in, in our characterization of masses and radii of exoplanets uh, using atmospheric characterization, we still don't get a good handle on their internal composition. We don't really uh, observe exoplanets in their, in their internal composition. And that's not a good thing when we try to break the degeneracies and uh, really probe what's inside them and what kind of makeup they have. So being able to really measure exoplanet material in situ would be very exciting. And in the last few years, there was some excitement over this. I'm sure you may have heard that we had two detections of interstellar objects in the last uh, five years or so. The first one was Oumuamua, and the second one was um, Borisov. And um, Borisov was probably a comet um, that came from the outer Oort cloud of some other uh, solar system. And uh, Oumuamua, we are not sure. There are very wild, crazy ideas out there. Uh, and also not so crazy ideas as well. And um, it, there's, I think there's a bigger uncertainty on its nature at this point in the literature. But um, the point is that we will be finding more of these very soon. And that's thanks to the Legacy uh, Survey of Space and Time, LSST, which will be conducted at the Rubin Observatory starting maybe, 20, maybe starting next, late next year or early 2024. 
And using LSST, we will be able to start exploring moving objects in the solar system uh, at very far distances, like past 100 AU or so. So I'm talking about extreme trans-Neptunian objects as well as potential interstellar objects. And finding these timely and then thinking about how to characterize them in detail is going to be very exciting, uh, I believe, in order to really pin down their um, uh, their nature. Here you're looking at a follow-up image of Oumuamua, um, and here um, this is just an animation of what how those objects will look like um, in the LSST survey, in the 10-year LSST survey. This is a simulation that uh, I'm currently working with a student on, and we are trying to see how we can actually predict these in the LSST data. Now, I will just finish off with a couple of uh, prospects as a conclusion. Here, you're looking at an eyeball Earth, basically a potentially habitable Earth. That's just artistic view of how we think these might actually um, turn out to, uh, to be habitable. Um, and um, thinking about 2020s, there will be basically two major efforts to continue the type of transiting exoplanet science. One will be TESS itself. Uh, further extended missions to test. Uh, as I mentioned, we are now about to start the second extended mission and there is no reason for tests not to get further extended missions as well. There is going to be Plato. Plato is going to be tests on steroids. It will have many more cameras and past 2026 or so, it will uh, pick up where Tess and Kepler, essentially Kepler, left off in finding and characterizing uh, small exoplanets uh, with large orbital periods. Uh, and these will all enable precise occurrence rate studies. And some of these detections will eventually turn out to be potentially habitable Earth analogs. So as small as Earth and with orbital periods as large as Earth. Now, an addition into the game will be microlensing that will be enabled by the Roman Space Telescope again around the same time, 2026 or so. It will conduct a statistical survey of exoplanets using the microlensing signature. Here you're looking at a plot where the, uh, the yield for the microlensing is actually plotted in context with Kepler. And TESS is pretty much re replicating Kepler, so you can imagine that uh, compared to transit surveys, the sensitivity will be to a few AU, uh, and um, definitely this will be a very exciting frontier. And how, how to calibrate Kepler and TESS and Roman Space Telescope with respect to each other will be a very exciting uh, exercise. And I've already talked about LSST. LSST will also find transiting exoplanets, and it will have many billions of pixels, many billions of uh, stars, and it will definitely be a truly interesting, uh, substantial data challenge to work with the LSST data. With that, let me just leave my conclusion slides. Uh, my conclusion is basically that exoplanets contextualize our, our planet Earth, our beloved Sun and the solar system, and they provide the statistical information, the demographical model within which we can start testing models of planet formation and evolution. Thank you. Thank you, Tansu. It was a wonderful talk. Um, do we have questions? I see Katerina has one in the chat. Do you want to read that out, Katerina? Or did he answer it in the talk? You're on mute still. Uh, first, uh, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful talk and overview about the uh, exploring exoplanet science. It's just, it's just amazing how much uh, is going on. What I'm wondering on about is what are the exoplanet radiate based upon? In the solar system, we always refer the gas giant planet radius to the one bar level. I understand that it comes from the transit observations, but I'm worried about the consistency of the data sets in terms of wavelength observations. When radii are determined at different uh, bands, are, are there correction mechanisms so that they are all referred to radius at the same uh, wavelengths? Uh, and um, how, the, how does the uh, wavelength observation impact the uh, transit, uh, the, the impact parameter? 
and also the limb darkening, which of course also depends then what you have for an atmosphere on the planet itself, and of course also of the star, uh, the host star. So I'm wondering how consistent are the radius data that we are using for uh, the plots of uh, some property versus radius or in the density uh, determinations. Yeah, thank you, Catherine. A great question. So, um, as you noted, um, we basically base the radius determination on on um, on a given pass band, um, and typically radii are measured um, using a wide band photometry. For example, Kepler was visible. TESS is also visible, but closer to the red and infrared. Um, and also in the infrared, we can measure radii, but again, in certain pest bands. How to calibrate these with respect to each other is, an, I think, an unsolved problem because um, there's really no well-defined continuum over which we can say, okay, there's no emission or absorption line here. So um, if you were to make a high resolution spectrum and measure the effective radius in, at every wavelength, essentially what we would expect to see would be a continuum. And that continuum would give us the true uh, continuum radius of, of the exoplanet. And you would start seeing spikes where the planet has a different effective wavelength. Now, um, this is certainly the case when the, the hydrodynamic um, equilibrium is not respected, when there is a hydrodynamic escape um, due to uh, the escaping gas, whatever that gas is, is it hydrogen, helium, whatever, wherever that gas emits or absorbs, you will have a different effective radius. But modulo that, you would otherwise expect a constant uh, depth across all wavelengths. And I just showed the plot, for example, for the case of W1856. We actually use that as an assumption um, to just uh, check the planetary nature of an occulter to say that the transit depths are consistent across um, some good order of magnitude wavelength uh, range. But in general, whenever we report radii, Obviously, um, we report it from a particular instrument, which has a particular passband. So Kepler detections, Kepler radii, have, basically they have to be corrected for the Kepler passband and test detections have to be corrected for the test passband. But there's also the fact that as long as the passband is wide enough, the corrections would be small. As oh. long as you're not making a measurement within maybe uh, 0.1 micron or so, uh, then the corrections you'd get probably are negligible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I see one hand. Dr. Sobotka. Yeah, go ahead, Lee. Hi. Uh, uh, thank you for your wonderful talk. Uh, you showed this um, nice uh, water uh, feature in this in the spectrum. And I was wondering what particular feature that was, uh, some uh, asymmetric uh, stretch overtone with some rotation on it. And so what, what was that molecular motion? And, in, and the reason I ask is um, uh, there should be many features. Uh, and from the collection of features, you can get other information other than the presence of water. So do, do, you, do you know what that uh, feature was? What, what uh, collection of uh, uh, vibrational uh, modes with rotations and so forth? Yeah, so um, basically that measurement is conducted using Hubble Space Telescope with C3. Uh, that's wide field camera three, and the grism is 141, so 141, that's the mi middle of the passband. So it's roughly covering one to something like 1.8 microns or so. So it's really near infrared. And uh, there's essentially one, um, one feature, one major feature that, fit, uh, that sits there, which is the main water feature. Now, I, I do 
definitely on, um, see your point that there are multiple substructures in it coming from different uh, modes of a hydrogen molecule, uh, the way it basically gets excited. Um, now, in our forward models, I don't think we have control over that. So, like, whenever we model, the only free parameter we have in our forward model when we do the uh, radiative transfer is just literally the abundance of water. So people who write that code, which is, you know, it's called ATMO, you may want to um, check it, but it's basically um, a retrieval code. It's, it's a fancy word, it's a jargon in this field, but retrieval means you get some spectrum and then try to infer the um, the atmospheric contents, basically, Th those um, details are marginalized out. So as a user of Atmo, I literally don't know. Uh, the only thing I fit for the, is the abundance. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is that in the exoplanet field, especially for HST, the available resolution we have is really fairly limited. It's really medium resolution. So we don't have the observational handle in resolving substructure in, in these spectra. Otherwise, it would get super exciting, obviously. Um, but these are not bright enough for us to do very high resolution spectroscopy on. Thank you. Thank you. Ryan, you wanna go ahead with your question? Uh, yeah, thank you, Tensu. Um, so in your uh, great talk, by the way, I love the the, what you said about the solar system, we have these initial conditions and it went one way, but it could have gone a thousand different ways, right? And that's what I think a lot of this exoplanet work is telling us about. It's, it's really cool. Um, your plot about um, what I think of as the Nice model versus the Grand Tack explanation uh, for, so the eccentricity, pumping up eccentricities or torques in the disk favoring these giant plant migrations. I was thinking like, in the solar system, it likely happened that the Grand Tack happened very, very early within the first couple million years. And then the Nice model migration happened much later. So these, these systems that I envision you're looking at, I think are much older than we think the Grand Tack happened. So I would assume it would have been a Nice model type thing. Um, so are, are, do you think the disks are still intact enough to, to evoke a Grand Tack model type evolution? I think, uh, yes, the, the answer is that it's unexplored. So as I said, the number of um, young systems for which we could invoke a uh, grand tech type hypothesis is fairly limited when it comes to exoplanets. Uh, the number is really like a few at this point. Um, and because of that, I don't think like we have enough statistics to start really constraining migration for very young systems. But I think that's where we are heading to. Um, now that we are starting to have a picture for uh, adult systems, I think this is where we wanna go. Um, and um, with, with that, obviously there are two uh, different subfields uh, of, of, of exoplanet research that are heading towards that. There's transit surveys and all that. Basically with TESS, for example, you can, do better Gaia astrometry, get better associations, find more young stars, look for more exoplanets around young stars, and that's how you go in that direction. Or from the other direction, the direct detection people are getting really close to doing that as well, because it, I think at some point, direct detection people will start seeing young Jupiters in their images of protoplanetary disks. And once that's the case, I think that's going to be an exciting and more potentially more relevant, um, uh, more, more relevant data set to answer this particular question. Great, right, thank you. All right, Bill, you're up next. Uh, thank, thanks, Jeff. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dalen, for the really um, informative and rich uh, tour of uh, exoplanetology. Um, I'm gonna follow on from the previous question, which is another one of these really sort of solar system oriented questions. You, you showed the older graph that uh, correlated the metallicity with the occurrence of, of Jupiters and super Jupiters. And so I was really gonna ask how well has that held up? And is there, really, is there evidence 
strong evidence for or against, would you say that strong evidence against the uh, dynamical instability model where, you know, basically a, a Jupiter or super Jupiter forms directly out of an instability and the nebula? Or can um, they both operate really? It just depends on what the tumor factor is and all the rest of it. Yeah, so I think regarding that top-down versus bottom-up approach, I think that's still an answer. That's why in my slides, I try to be democratic to both sides. I did highlight one, yeah. um, but I think both are still in the literature, like re they remain as uh, plausible ways. And part of that is because we tend to find, I mean, in the, in, the, in the last 10 years, one thing that really started happening is with WISE, we have been finding a lot of brown dwarfs. And brown dwarfs are really changing the way we think about this transitionary regime, because it's not obvious how brown dwarfs form. Do they form like planets? Do they form like stars? Or is it that, you know, some planets can also have uh, form bottom up and as well as uh, top to bottom. Like maybe we shouldn't really treat this as a problem of you know planets or whatever objects um, below a certain mass form this way and objects above a certain mass form that way. Maybe that's not the case. Maybe there's another controlling factor which we don't yet know and that this is more like a mixed uh, thing. I think that's more likely at this point. Um, and one thing that's really we that one thing we need to answer this question is more hot Jupiters and more Jupiters in general, and um, that's been one of our main motivation in trying to find more Jupiters from TESS. I showed one slide where we basically did some extra effort to find more Jupiters, and sometimes whenever we go talk about this, people don't really get excited about Jupiters. The issue is like people have been so much focused on small terrestrial planets for reasons that might be obvious that they, you know, habitability and earth contextualization and all that motivation. Jupiters, I think, are now getting really boring. Like, you know, we've discovered them, we've counted them, we've kind of explained how they uh, form about, but I, I, I think we need to do better about, uh, about that problem. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, did you... uh, sorry, I have another question if I'm not... I already asked one, but this um, from so this this brown dwarf thing, I guess I, I don't really understand. So are you saying that these brown dwarfs are orbiting uh, orbiting stars? So yeah, they're brown dwarf star binaries, basically. And some of those are thought to um, be produced through common envelope when the orbital period is small. Um, but it's not obvious, for example, how brown dwarfs um, can whether can whether brown dwarfs can also have uh, form in uh, using uh, core accretion. The the problem, the theoretical problem with core accretion is that you need to come up with. I think the typical value in the literature is like ten Earth radii. Uh, sorry, uh, ten Earth masses. So you need a core with a mass of roughly ten Earth masses to do this. The issue is how do you get that? Because your pebbles are accreting very fast, you're very fast losing your protoplanetary disk, especially how do you do that that far out from your star? That's, I think, a theoretically unsolved problem. Leave alone all the observational you know, uh, demographics and all that. I think theoretically there's, there are problems with it. Okay, so you can form a brown dwarf by accreting a, ro a ten so uh, Earth mass rocky core? I right? think, yeah, that okay. I, didn't, I, I thought it was a, a gas thing. That's that's fascinating. Thank you. I, no, I think you have to have enough gas. I think uh, the generic answer I would say is still the school of thought is that it's uh, gravitational instability producing brown force. Yeah. But I think it's a viable question. Uh, now that we have these hot Jupiters that are like almost transitionary to brown dwarfs, okay, we should be asking the other question, whether it's even possible to do core accretion with them. Great, thank you. Thank you. Katrina, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, just, just a follow-up. As, as uh, Chancel said, it's just an arbitrary division to say everything heavier than 13 uh, uh, Jupiter masses is a brown, brown dwarf and, 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 and so forth. So that's just an internal evolution uh, argument concerning the deuterium burning. 
But I think from the planetary formation mode, or, or does it form like a binary star system? It's absolutely not clear what happens there. And I think the strongest evidence that we have that brown dwarfs can also form like uh, stars is we have binary systems that are made of brown dwarfs only. And then we have uh, very heavy planets that, that looks like a planet around a normal uh, dwarf star that just happens to be uh, to have more than 13 so uh, Jupiter masses. So that looks like a planet that, that, that is just arbitrary and defining brown dwarf blood by formation mode is impossible because we don't know how they formed. So people keep that, that is just a, a name game. And I think there we need a bright idea from Tansu in order to figure out how we actually classify these objects. <laughs> Well, re regarding naming, I mean, exoplanet literature literally started calling anything uh, that is uh, that is less massive than 80 Jupiter masses uh, su substellar object, and that includes brown dwarfs and exoplanets. Some exoplanet catalogs actually include brown dwarfs, including the TOI catalog. So, so whenever, for example, we find a brown dwarf, we call it a confirmed planet for the lack of a better name. Um, so this has this has been really, uh, uh, I think, a move that um, that the literature is making. Uh, that like people started to realize that this thirteen point eight Jupiter mass is really not magical. It does change things regarding internal composition, but that has nothing to do with the formation history. Um, that it just changes its equation of state. With this regard, if I'm just my follow up, one more thing. Are you aware about any service that would look for deuterium in the uh, 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 gas giant uh, exoplanets or brown dwarf? Because that would be the final answer to for the classic brown dwarf definition. Is that in the planning or technically feasible or are we not there yet? I think it is technically feasible. Um... The question is to really look at the density distribution of Jupiters, especially in context with respect to uh, their irradiation. Now, the, radi the density distribution of Jupiters will certainly get a contribution from external irradiation. So we have to filter those out. For the cold population, you can ask, is there a unique density? you know, an asymptotic density, or is there some scatter that would otherwise be explained by some internal remnant energy? Some of that could also come from tidal sources, so you have to also leave those out. Some of them could potentially come from, I don't know, um, mergers or remnant energy, like in young systems, so you have to filter those out. But in the unique, in the unique uh, asymptotic limit of cold, collisionless Jupiters, do you, have, yeah, do you get some kind of a variation? That's well, a great question, I think. Well, my, uh, my question was more, if it's, if it's a planet in the classical sense, it should have all its primordial deuterium still in the atmosphere, versus a brown right. dwarf fully, being fully convective should, right. should just be having burned it away. And that happens relatively fast, I would assume. So, and I'm really was wondering for years now, are people gonna be able to see the deuterated methane or HD observations in exoplanets? I think that's, that's something that people have been looking into. That's not my area of expertise, but I did hear that people are really excited to doing that. And obviously uh, that would differentiate them from brand wars and make that connection very clear. Um, but I, I'm not knowledgeable of any detection um, uh, in the li recent literature. I would need a lot of uh, spectral resolution, which you mentioned earlier is, is a challenge. Yeah. Yes. I want to thank our speaker, Tantu. Dalen, one last time for that wonderful comparative characterizations of solar systems, for finding how unique we are and uh, you know the gaps in the science that he hopes to answer with test data and LSST in the future. Thank you, Tansu. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for the hospitality. So have a nice day. Have a great evening. <laughs>